Hello everyone. My uh, my apologies for the delay in getting started. We had some stuff going on over here. Um, some of it was that I did not prepare very well for this stream. Um, some of it was that I needed to go down and take some food to our building managers who are awesome. Um, and that just took a minute that I didn't really think I had that I would need to spend. So, um, tonight, <laughs> uh, we're going to start in on the last few figures from Jesseon's copy of Battle Station 2nd Edition. Uh, which, we've got a couple of figures from here. So we've got the uh, spaceship, which is just a generic little, uh, generic little spaceship. It does actually correspond to a specific in-game um, configuration. Um, but it's the only one that comes with the base copy of the second edition. Uh, right here we've got a Whistler that I've already painted up. Um, this was like my first real triumph with dry brushing. I was very proud of this guy. Um, I felt like he came out brilliantly. He's like a little ball of feathers and uh, I've helpfully labeled him the Lorax. Um, so there's that. And we've got a Crocodilian, which is one of the Beastman critters. Um, based on the way I've painted him, I think I intended him to be a pilot. Um, I did this ages ago. Uh, and then we have a Gorilloid, another Beastman, um, and he appears to be a scientist. I did color code all of their gear. Um, most of the ones that I've already painted are not here. Um, like the, the vast majority, I think I've done like 30 some of them. Um, and most of them, all but these four here, uh, are currently in the possession of the game's owner. So, uh, so we don't have those here to show off. Um, I can post pictures later uh, once we've got the, uh, the full collection done, uh, or possibly sooner. Um, most of the other ones do not actually look pretty good. Um, I'm really proud of the Diploid. Um, that was like the first figure that I painted after I learned how to thin paint, so it's the first one that doesn't look really crappy. Um, it's also the first one that I got, uh, the first one that I painted after I got my first bottle of Vallejo paint. Before that I was using Craft Store acrylics, so most of the old figures I am not super proud of um, by my current standards, um, but I did them as best I could with what I knew how to do at the time. So, so those, uh, Essentially, I think that I did pretty well, given what I knew how to do at the time. Um, but ultimately, it's not something that I'd be proud of now. I've just knocked something over. Grand. My display back up here. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> um, so what we have left to do is we've got four humans, four Zawalans. We will not be doing these Wallens tonight, uh, because uh, they are a little bit gross and I need to actually remove uh, their old paint job before I proceed with them. Um, I'm getting a lot of rendering lag right now, and I don't know why, because my computer isn't doing anything. <laughs> um, it seems to have cleared up on its own. Ah, welcome. Tracing Steve Buscemi's outline. That's a really weird thing to say. Um, but okay, sure. Uh, so this picture that we've got up here is... Uh, okay, so sorry, we've got the Zawalans. We've got four of them to paint. Uh, they need some cleanup. I, yeah, no, I believe you. Um, uh, so once I've cleaned those up, we can do those, but they're not in a condition that I can do them in right now. Uh, so I need to... Basically, I started painting them, and I did really, really badly, so I needed to clear up all the old paint, and I sort of left them out and got them all dusty, so I need to fix that before I give them a serious try. Uh, however, we do have our four humans, um, two each of these two sculpts. So we've got you know, this guy doing his uh, wide stance, and this girl doing her narrow stance, and we have two of each. Uh, we also have a set, a suit of powered armor, um, which uh, I've heard described as uh, Tony Stark in a uh, 
in a Humpty Dumpty suit, uh, which I completely agree with. Um, and I might actually steal somebody else's idea for that because their paint job looked really good. Uh, we also have another Beastman, the Elephantoid. This big dude with a gun in his trunk and a hammer in his fist and a fist in his other fist. Uh, we also have three more weird aliens, uh, most of which are animal people. We've got the Lupinoid, who is a wolf person. That is the last of the proper beast men um, from the Planet of Dr. Moreau expansion. Uh, we also have a Meek. I don't remember what expansion they came from. Blocky. What does that mean, blocky? Um, I'm going to go through these minis real quick. I've got one more to show off, and then we can decide what we're doing. Um, and while we figure that out, I can also show you, uh, show the stream, whatever it is that you're trying to show me. Um, so we've got a meek. They're just, like, cat people or lion people or whatever. It's basically lion-o. Um, what, what do you mean? Because that could be lag on your end. I'm seeing that I'm transmitting it good speed. So if it, unless it's out of focus, then I don't think that's on my end. Now let's manually focus and see if that does better. <clears throat> so this is the one that's currently on screen. This is called a Kerbite. Uh, there we go, he's in focus now. It is sort of a shrub with a bunch of legs and tongues. Kerbites are weird, I don't understand them. Does, this, does that look better on your end, or...? It looks fine to me. Other than obviously being blurry. So I just turned autofocus off and... And that... Uh... So in your screenshot, it just looks out of focus. Uh, which is normal, because this camera is not good at doing what I'm using it for. And meanwhile, we have... Alright. Yeah, okay. Sure. That's, um... Right. Well... Oh, you created this! <laughs> nice. Um... I mean, I'm over here wondering why you have done this, but, I mean, I'm proud of you, I guess. Oh, oh, you just clipped him out. There's our curbite. Well, best wishes for figuring out how to create Steve Buscemi. He does. Kerbites have, let's see, the sculpt depicts them with, uh, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six tongues, six legs, a pile of little tentacles on its head, and a giant shrub for a body. Kerbites are weird. I really just need, like, a flat textured surface to put behind stuff so that it doesn't... so that it knows what to focus on. Blech. Excuse me. Okay, so are we thinking... Kerbite? Are we thinking meek? 
which looks like this. Are we thinking uh, lupinoid? Are we thinking elephantoid? Um, are we thinking powered armor, <laughs> which they only have in... Uh, so this is all art from the Kickstarter. Uh, and then we also have the humans in addition to those. So elephantoid is our vote. Oh, sorry for all the yawning. And it's uh, later than expected, but as promised, our landlady is blowing up my phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that's funny. It is unanimous, all one of you. Okay, well. <laughs> so, in that case, I am also going to be using this for inspiration slash blatant theft. Um, so, somebody else has painted the same mini, and that's that's what we're looking at here. Um, yeah, he did, uh, tackle the curbite. Oh my goodness! Excuse me. Uh, he did some Zwollens, and this is his Tony Stark in a, in a Humpty Dumpty suit. But yeah, we're gonna be, we're gonna be borrowing inspiration from this. We're not going to steal his art. <laughs> But we are going to be adapting his ideas. So, for example, um, all of this business up in here is depicted in. Yes, I did. Uh, <laughs> all of this stuff here was depicted in the original art as metal or metallic. Um, so, like, a, like some kind of, you know, armor suit. Um, but the way that it's depicted in this guy's paint job, this. This guy's paint job uh, is that. <laughs> no, but we're going to call them the same because it's funny. Um, so, what this guy over here has done uh, is he's depicted it as like a bodysuit with armor padding on it. And I think I like that better. Um, so, we're going to do something a little bit more. In that style. Damn, they reach a lot. Oh my good grief! Excuse me. Ooh, I need to take a drink. I'm gonna wake myself up a little bit. Ooh. Okay. All right. So he's just going to sit there off to the side for a second. Push these guys together and have him sitting there. Sorry. Sorry, I don't know what to tell you. I'm still struggling with side effects from my new medication and it is making it very difficult to consistently be awake. <laughs> oh, heck. <laughs> I need my color chart because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna borrow some ideas from this art, but we're ultimately gonna base it off of this one a little bit more. Um, he does seem to definitely be more of a marine than a scientist, pilot, or engineer on account of the giant hammer, the gun, uh, the fisty sort of pose. Um, everything about him looks more like he's in the middle of a fight. So, uh, for his skin... Uh, 
I think what we'll do is undercoat it with charred brown and then put stonewall gray over it, which is these two. And that's going to take care of most of his skin. And then, uh, let's see, his tusks, we're going to use bone white. So that's going to be probably our best color for that. So we got bone white. Let's see how much texture those have on them. Not a lot. Make sure there's no dust sitting on him before we get started. Okay. Fix this magnifier. It's sitting in a weird spot. Okay. So yeah, it looks like he's got those same plates all the way around. Um, his skin is pretty clearly defined, which is fortunate. Um, I think I'm going to paint him in a onesie. Not for any real reason, I just think it's funny. Uh, his skin, the skin on his legs has a lot of texture, but the skin on his face and arms doesn't. Mm, which we can work with. Not perfectly, but... It'll, it'll do. Okay. Kind of figuring this out in real time as you uh, as you watch <laughs> while you wait. Um, okay, let's see. So we're gonna need some red. I'm going to use uh, Scarlet Red and then maybe dry brush it with a little bit of Bloody Red for his outfit. And then on top of that, we will put some white and uh, some... Uh, let's see. What color do we want his armor plating? I'm thinking like a darkened gunmetal. And then dry brush that with silver, these colors. So that'll be his clothing, these parts. Uh, and the gunmetal will go towards the hammer and his uh, gun as well. Blue in the plating. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how I want to handle that. Because that's, that's just like... I think that's mostly supposed to be lighting from what appears to be the laser sword that he was holding in the art. Um, but they didn't actually end up using that for his main design. Instead, he's got a gun in his, his trunk right here. So there in his trunk, you can see there's like a little laser pistol or something. Um, ooh, so he's not carrying anything that should have that lighting on it. Get a silly little beastie here. Get them all attached. Um, the way that we we're doing the bases on these is a little bit different um, because I started one way and I don't want to change it now since all of the other ones are completely uniform. Uh, we will be using a cheap craft acrylic uh, to deal with that and it sucks a little bit that it has to be that kind of paint and done in that way, but the effect I think is overall pretty pretty serviceable. It's not too bad. So I think we'll be okay on that, doing it that way. Um, they do need two coats of dull coat as a result of that, but we can do them in batches as a result uh, as well. 
I don't think there's going to be any problem handling it that way. So, uh, now that we've got our paints mostly figured out, we'll, we'll, uh, hmm, let's see. I don't think that there's anything special we need to do at this stage for his equipment. Um, we're just going to want to keep an eye on that, make sure that we don't overdo it, uh, and make it hard, like, obscure any details on it. Make it too hard to do later. Uh, the hammer has a lot of little bits on it. None of them are going to be particularly hard to paint, but I'm not really sure what I'm going to do with them. Might try, like, painting over it in white and then giving it all those crazy colors in the art. But I'm not sure if I want to do that. I think it looks a little weird. I suppose we'll wait for Jesse on, and if he wants it that way, then I'll, uh, I'll do it that way. And if he wants it some other way, I'll do it that way instead. We'll be fine. So... We'll start off with our charred brown to base coat his uh, skin. And I'll give it four drops of each color on this because he's real big. He's very large. Okay, and we'll grab up our brush and a toothpick to stir the paint. Get that going. I think that's actually a good color for that shadow. Um, we will, of course, want to wash him, but we want to get all of the base colors down first. Is he dirty? <laughs> well, not yet. We're going to cover him up with paint, though. Um, now, I did prime these figures long before I really understood how to properly prime. Uh, so as a result, they are all just flat gray. I haven't applied any sort of interesting techniques to them or anything like that. Um, just kind of left them in this condition. Red video game characters, Mario, uh, Knuckles, um, uh, Quote, uh, Blop, uh, who else? Uh, Pulse Man is sort of pinkish and orangish, so maybe he counts. Um, Uh, yes, quote the player character from, um, a Cave Story. Which is sort of a spoiler, but if you haven't played it by now, you're probably never going to. The reason that his name isn't immediately obvious is because you don't find it out until, like, most of the way through the second harder playthrough, so... There. <laughs> Elephant man bear pig, yeah. Do you know, um, last year Al Gore went on Stephen Colbert and actually got asked about man bear pig? It was kind of amazing. Apparently he thinks it's hilarious.
It's apparently it's something from The Simpsons, which like I've heard the phrase a lot, but I don't really get the joke, honestly. Holy crap, so much paint. He is large. That's supposed to be leg or pant. I cannot tell. Oh, South Park. Oh, okay. Sorry, for some reason I thought it was from the Simpsons movie, but that's probably because I got it confused with Spider Pig. Yeah, apparently, apparently Al Gore is very tickled by that whole thing. Spider-Man Fair Spider-Pig. Oh no. What have I wrought? What have I wrought? So I suppose now is a good time is as good a time as any um, to weigh in on the business with Wingspan. Having now played it, Wingspan is a pretty freaking good game. Very typical of Stonemeyer's uh, Stonemeyer's titles in terms of quality, gameplay style, um, the art. Pretty much everything is consistent with everything you would expect from any of their titles, really. Um, and they all have you know, those, those certain commonalities in terms of style and and mechanics and all of this. Um, it's an engine builder primarily. And, uh, and it is very fun, it's very good, very well made. And at the same time, I, it is probably not as good as the Board Game Geek rating makes it out to be, and the reason that the board game creating is so high is because of what may or may not be artificial inflation due to scarcity. In other words, there are credible theories that Stonemeyer is artificially inflating the rating of that, uh, that title by keeping it unreasonably scarce, even though they have the means of producing more and, and distributing it better. Um, there's also something going on with how they're handling Amazon sales, um, where one of their warehouses is selling stuff to Amazon, and it, yeah, there's just a big mess there. Uh, some guy from Las Vegas who runs a chain that is trying to become Walmart, like the Walmart of, video, of uh, board games, called him out, and like, that was a whole different stupid thing, and apparently that guy is super skeezy and, like, has gross business practices of his own. So it's kind of hard to know whose side to be on, because everybody is very publicly making fools of themselves. So with that in mind, um, I don't know whether Wingspan deserves its place, I don't know if it deserves its scarcity, but I can vouch for the fact that it's a pretty freaking good game. And I'm very pleased with my purchase. I'm just, you know, most people don't have the opportunity that I did because I got on a waiting list in February. Um, and uh, got passed over. Yeah, it's so weird. It's so weird. There's like all these public call-out posts and just, like, there's no point to the conflict either. It's just like everybody's acting super unprofessionally for no obvious reason. It's just very weird. Um, <clears throat> but regardless of all of that, um, the only hesitation that I have about Wingspan is the fact that I only got it because I was on a waiting list early enough that I happened to get one of, I'm not kidding, five copies. 
that made it of the third print run of this game to our local game store. Literally, they only got five copies. They have a waiting list of 50. And it's a small place. Like, it's, it's not a big place. They would have more on the waiting list, except that everybody just kind of went like, yeah, I'll just wait until next year. And, you know, kind of gave up on it. Which is just bizarre, you know? Um, because of all companies, like, surely Stonemeyer can muster the resources to produce, to, to meet demand. But apparently not. Yeah, it's it's very strange, and I, I sort of wish I didn't know what was going on with it, because it's, it's kind of like tainting my opinion of Jamie Stegmeier. Um, and, like, I, I want to like him, because he makes really cool games. It's, um... It's a bit like Phil Fish with Fez. You know, Fez is a great game, but Phil Fish is a scumbag. Um, and that's one of those things where, like, you got to separate the art from the artist. You know, I, I like Wingspan, and I don't know how I feel about what Stonemeyer is doing, because I don't really know what Stonemeyer is doing yet. You know, the, the, the truth has not come out yet, whether it's actually what he's saying it is, or if it's what the other guy says it is, or if it's something else entirely, no one knows. So like I don't I don't have the information necessary to form an opinion on that. So I just have to wait until the facts are clear. But the games are good and I still want to support them developing good games. Um Wingspan itself um you know from my from the experience that I had with it just today because um, I finally got my copy of it uh is really good. It's um it's like action selection uh, from a pool of counters that you have each round that diminishes by one with every round because you have to you have to like commit a counter to scoring. Um, you get birds, you get food, and you get eggs. Um, the more bird birds that you have in each of three climates uh, or or like habitats um, determines like how many eggs you need in order to bring another bird into that area. Uh, so there's like that as a currency. Um, eggs can convert to getting more birds, uh, like bird cards to choose from. Uh, bird cards can be discarded for uh, uh, extra resources, extra like food. Um, and then food can be discarded for extra um, eggs. Only under certain conditions on each of those, though. Um, and then food is required to bring in each species of bird, and then each species of bird has its own like special powers that it does. Um, and then like every time that you take an action, you activate all the birds in that climate, so all of their special abilities trigger if they have them. So like that's the engine building aspect of it, is that the longer that you go, the more, um, the more abilities that you have, and, and the stronger each action that you take is. But at the same time, you get fewer actions to divide over those areas. So it's, it's interesting. It, it really effectively balances... Um, um, it really effectively balances like scarcity with, um, with the strength of your actions. So it, it keeps things really proportional as the game goes on, which I think is really cool. Um, there's a whole bunch of like bonus cards, secret objectives, basically. Um, that will change your gameplay style. One of those won the game for me. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, like, it was actually a pretty narrow game. I, I won by two points. <laughs> um, But, uh, but yeah, there's, it looks, it seems like there's a bunch of different viable strategies. How <laughs> could you wingspan his birds? Well, I won with eggs. I made more birds. Four points. Oh, I thought it was only by two. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely glad that I purchased it. Like it, I I think it was well worth the retail price, but like maybe don't buy it from a scalper. 
<laughs> it's like, I don't think that's going to make this situation any better. <laughs> oh. Hmm. This guy's actually going to be harder to paint than I realized because of how big he is. Um, so Mel, what, what did you, what did you think of Wingspan when you played it? When we played it? What, was, what were your feelings on the, the game as a whole? <laughs> I mean, I do like Scythe's theme a little bit better, but... I think the engine building aspects of Wingspan are sort of easier to catch on to than the engine building aspects of Scythe. At least for me. Okay, how so? Well, what about Scythe do you think is so much better? And also, I guess, what were your expectations of it? Because that's, that's definitely going to color your feelings on it. Because I personally, I feel like it does really, really well at what it's trying to do, but it's also trying to do something very different than Scythe. But like with some overlap of concept. So like a lot of the mechanics are really familiar, but I think it's trying to accomplish something very different with those mechanics. And I think it succeeds at what it was trying to do. Okay, have fun. <laughs> I just like, I, I definitely think that like, expecting it to be Scythe is going to be a problem. <laughs> it's, it's a very different game, it's a whole different idea. And even though it shares a lot of concepts, it's, it's just never going to be the same thing. Nor should it, I don't think. I guess part of the problem is that we've been playing, we had been playing Charger Stone. Um, and that kind of, that introduced a lot of the ideas that Wingspan used. Also, if the stream suddenly goes down, it's possible we have had a power outage because there is a lot of thunder here. Or at least there was when I started. Charger Stone? I really like Charger Stone. Um, it's definitely not a perfect game. Um, I have played a lot more Charger Stone than I've played of Scythe. I've only played one game of Scythe. And I, as much as I want to play, again, it's not really an option most of the time. Um, although with Scythe Digital out now, I, I might have the opportunity to change that. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed Scythe, um, but I just don't have the experience necessary to, like, to, to really rank it next to Charger Stone, just because I've played so much more Charger Stone. Um, yeah, Charger Stone, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I, was, I was very surprised by a lot of it. I mean, like, when Mel gets back, they can tell you that uh, I lost my freaking mind when I found the Sky Islands. Like, I had no idea that was a thing and it took me completely off guard. Like I figured, oh, we're gonna open, you know, this, that, or the other tuck box. You know, and I, I kind of was like braced for, oh, we're gonna get a new mechanic, a new little thing. But like, I was completely unprepared for what it was because it just wasn't, oh, you're not that far, okay. Well, all I'll 
I'll tell you then is um, there's some stuff that you can kind of see coming, and some stuff comes out of absolutely nowhere. What impressed me is that I didn't realize that the component existed. <laughs> like, I wasn't looking for it in the box. And I was thus extremely surprised to discover what the game told me to do. There's also some stuff in there that's like... So so how far are you, actually? What What's... What's going on in the story where you're at? I guess I probably should have led with that. Hmm, I'm dropping so many frames. Well, that's fair. Um, can you give me like the gist of it. What what do you remember, and we'll go from there. Welcome back. So Mel, um, can you just real quick? Uh, verify exactly how much I lost my mind uh, when I discovered a certain component in the box. Uh, yeah, it's it's true. Like it's, you know, it's one thing to like open a tuck box and find like, oh hey, something was in the tuck box, but this was not that, and it didn't even occur to me that it was a thing. I found out about that before I found out about Gloomhaven's "Don't open this until you feel you are ready" or like "Open when you feel you deserve it." envelope um and so like i went and checked for that and i mean look at that there it was you know um but yeah charger stone does something similar and it pulled it off very well in my opinion part of that is because i'm a little bit clueless about legacy games <laughs> Trying to decide whether I should try and do all of his clothing assistance. Yeah, yeah. So that's going to get you minions. And there's a few varieties of those. Pretty much like one for every major, like non resource thing, non specific resource thing. Yeah, it, the way that it builds, I think, is probably its greatest strength. It's got so much to it, but it. it Builds onto it really slowly. Like it waits until the player is ready to, to like reach for something and then it gives it to you. With a few exceptions. You know, if, if you haven't gotten every, uh, every minion by a certain point, it just unlocks everything for you. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's really good at like, at slowly revealing complexity instead of just throwing everything at you at the beginning. Um, it, even once you have all the rules unlocked, it's still pretty manageable. Um, like, it never gets overwhelming. Um, but it does get fairly complex by the end. Although, I, I mean, I guess I should be careful what I say, because my mom was in our campaign and found it very overwhelming from, like, the second game onwards. <laughs> It was kind of hilarious, actually. 
It's like she understood all the rules, but had a really hard time like figuring out what moves would result in points consistently. So like she'd see one specific thing and get like really fixated on a short term goal, and then like complete it and have no idea what to do for the rest of the game. And like, oh, I I built the thing that I wanted to build. Now what do I do? Well, I don't know, mom. What do you want to do? You know what what uh, what's gonna give you points based on the abilities that you have right now? And she just well, I don't know. What do I do to get points? <laughs> Just literally anything. Just do whatever. <laughs> it's pretty funny. So, sort of a sort of a meta level analysis paralysis that was happening there. Okay. You know, I thought the elephantoid would be easier to paint than this, but he's just got a lot of really awkward angles because he's so tall. Like, it's not that difficult, it's just, like, hard to see what I'm doing because he's just very far away and I can't really get him any closer to the magnifier. <laughs> very strange. Oof. Uh, so, Mel, you are a lot better at spoiler-free uh, discussion than I am. So what does Jesse have to look forward to as he plays through more of the Charterstone campaign? Discuss. <laughs> Also, since you're back, feel free to um, continue explaining. Well, okay, then we won't tell you. <laughs> That's why I asked Mel to do it, because, like, I'm going to let something slip. That's true. That is true. true. It's true. Shenanigans. Very much shenanigans. Um, one thing that I will point out that took us a while to figure out, like, like almost all the way through the campaign before we figured this out, um, don't forget to count the extra glory for the player that succeeds in the guidepost objective. Because we literally, we were in like game nine or so before we realized that you were supposed to get extra glory for that. Uh, and then we had to like reverse engineer who had gotten what in which game, which was difficult. Yeah, the, the way that it kind of reveals itself is really impressive. And I don't, like, maybe other legacy games are like that, but better, I don't know. I've heard people complaining that it isn't as good as, like, Pandemic Legacy or Risk Legacy, but, like, I get the feeling that maybe they're just looking for something different, you know? So, um, so Mel, please do continue. Um, you were explaining sort of what you were expecting from Wingspan and how it relates to your experience with Scythe. The price tag, what components have lasted longer, $40 again. Yeah, I think that's fair to say, yeah. 
I mean, the, the components are very nice, like, they're very good quality. But you're right that they're not very plentiful. Um, it is also worth noting that right now there's kind of a um, an external factor to game pricing, um, and that is that there's all of these threatened tariffs with China, um, which is where pretty much everything is produced, uh, which would, of course, not affect the actual production pretty much at all. It just, uh, like, like on China's side, it just gets passed directly on to United States consumers. Um, the last estimate that I read suggests that any given board game could be expected to be marked up by between 25 and 50% uh, because of that factor alone. Um, the actual tariffs aren't in place yet, so that might not be why it's priced the way that it is. Um, it could just be that they're gouging it, um, which would be consistent with the, the rumors. You know, that, that they're trying to artificially inflate the price and artificially inflate the rating and just generally squeeze a lot more money out of this game than it would otherwise deserve. Um, but at the same time, it, it very well might not have anything to do with their policies and might just be something that they have to do because of their manufacturing chain. Um, the fact that it's super scarce, they might be able to do, like, they might feel like they can charge more for it because the product has been, has been valued higher by the community. Um, you know, it's, it's very much the, like, at, at this point, anybody that's decided that they want Wingspan badly enough to, you know, be on the waiting list, like I was, basically, uh, is going to be willing to pay that for it, even if it is a $40 game, they're still going to pay $60 because it's scarce. Um, so, it's, it's a weird situation, like, the price tag in particular is just a very weird thing. And and the whole situation surrounding it is weird. So that alone, like we we can't we can't be sure whether or not it's necessary for it to be that price. Like there just isn't a way of being certain. Um. So yes, it might be overpriced. It also might even be underpriced, depending on what's going on with the the manufacturing and distribution side. Which there has definitely been something going on there, it's just not exactly clear what at this point. And we won't know for a while, like, I don't think that's going to shake out anytime soon, really. Um... At some point, we will probably know um, one way or the other exactly what's happening, and, and then we'll kind of be able to answer that question a little bit more. But you know, I'm, I'm not hung up on that so much as trying to figure out what the game is in a vacuum. You know, like like ignoring price tag because that that may or may not be the manufacturer's decision or the the, the production team's decision. But so you were you were comparing it to Scythe, so I'm curious what you were what kind of what you had in mind when you were saying that. Hmm. Okay, so you just expected more like more density to it then? Is that about right? Is that is that fair to say? Yeah. I mean I, I think that that's fair. I don't think it's necessarily fair to criticize the game based on that, but certainly having a, a negative experience with it because of that is, is completely fair. Um, 
I think it's important to kind of try and look at what it's trying to be and see how well it accomplishes that. You know, not, not just whether it's good or not, but whether it succeeds in its goals. And it certainly seems to have succeeded in what it's trying to be. It just isn't trying to be the same thing as the other Stonemeyer titles that we've played. It's, it's trying to be its own thing that's quite different. Despite the fact that it shares some concepts. So I don't know if that makes it a good game by itself. I, I don't think it probably does. I think that, you know, it, it needs other factors. It needs to be fun, for one thing. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I, I enjoyed it. I, I liked the simplicity a lot, actually. Um, it, it made it very approachable and, and straightforward. Um, one other thing that's worth remembering is that Scythe is actually not that complicated. Like, there's, there's tons of stuff in it, but there's no complicated mechanics. It's all really straightforward. And I think that's easy to overlook with how big of, and, uh, and imposing that game looks. We're going to do his tusks in this color, and then we're going to do his toes as well. And then we'll hit his tunic in red, scarlet. Guaranteed if, anybody, if this guy eventually makes it to the table. Somebody's going to kill him for his ivory. Just overpaint these and clean them up because that's going to be easier than getting it right the first time with this color. Ooh. That's the right number of toes, right? I don't know, I guess I found the um, the approachable simplicity really refreshing after, like, after getting to the end of Charterstone and kind of going, like, starting at this point would be impossible, you know? And kind of seeing Wingspan, which is, it's the early stages of Charterstone, where everything is, like, like, the decision space is shallower, but it's still engaging. So, yeah, there's there's a lot less stuff to do, but, like... I don't know. I don't know. I just I found it a lot more contemplative and, and like pleasant in that regard. You know, this is purely short sightedness, but I did not think that I'd be painting toenails today. Just did not occur to me that this is something I was gonna do when I woke up. Honestly, as weird as it sounds, expect to paint toenails every day. Yeah, as weird as that, as weird as this might sound, like this uh, painting elephant toenails, to me, like just intuitively seems much more reasonable than painting my toenails or like people toenails. <laughs> oh man, what kind of a life do I lead where this is more normal than? 
what everybody else does. Uh, don't get me wrong, I like it that way, but sometimes you just gotta have these moments of self-awareness and deal with the fact that you're weird. Yeah, elephant toenails, yeah. It's very, very typical. Very ordinary. Definitely not something a weird person would do. That would just be silly. What is this, a circus? Now we'll be using an umber wash on this guy. Oh, goodness, excuse me. Some quick touch ups. Oh no, I've overtouched. It's okay, I can touch it up in both directions. It's fine. <laughs> Grab some water to re-up this paint before it all goes, uh, goes dry on me. Very nearly did. Just about got that. A quick little bit of cleanup, make sure that these are all looking right. on to his shirt. This time I think I want the uh, metal bits to get washed as well, which is not something that I've typically done in, on the other pieces that we've worked on during this stream. Uh, 
We do want this guy to be rather brighter though, so that's uh, that's fine. Can have a little bit more uh, grunge and texture to him than most of the other guys, but that's just because of the skin that we're going for, not because he is supposed to be any less colorful. So we're going to go with Scarlet Red and Gunmetal, respectively, for those parts. Uh, we'll start with the red. All right. So this color goes on really bright, but it actually tends to dry pretty, pretty like dark and dingy. So I will not be surprised if this ends up looking a little bit gross before we dry brush it with the uh, bloody red, which is going to be a lot brighter. Okay. So it looks like he doesn't really have any armor underneath his arms. It's all just around the, the front and back, which does make this a little bit easier. And, bonus, he doesn't wear pauldrons, so I don't have to paint any more pauldrons tonight. I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah, <laughs> add some pauldrons. No, screw you. <laughs> I painted six sets of pauldrons in a week. Don't make me paint anymore. Now, whenever we decide to do the uh, the Kerbite, the Meek, and the Lupinoid, we're probably going to be able to get two of them done in one night, because these models are generally less detailed than, uh, than the ones in Gloomhaven. Um, particularly between the, uh, the Meek and the Lupinoid, I think we could probably do both of those in a night. Um... I don't know that we could do that, but I, I think we probably could. At the very least, we could make progress on both. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, this guy's probably going to take us all night, just because he's very big. This paint scheme is going to be pretty simple, especially compared to what we've gotten used to lately, but... But he's just very big, and it takes a while for the paint to get everywhere that it needs to go.
Hmm. There is a little bit of an oddity to this design that I'm not sure how to handle. And that is that he's got this sort of, um, this, like, protruding belt. It gives him even more of a muffin top than necessary. And I honestly, I can't tell whether that's supposed to be a belt, or if it's supposed to be just, like, part of how his torso is layered. A little bit strangely. It's this bit right here. Like this line across here that stands out really heavily against the rest of it, and I don't know if it's supposed to be metal or not. Yeah, I'm actually really liking the look of this guy so far. Simple, but effective. Definitely clearly communicates what he's supposed to be and what he's supposed to be doing. So, I am happy with it. This bit here on his butt, I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be fabric even though it's raised, because uh, it crinkles like the rest of the fabric around it and there's like texture that carries over from one spot to the next so i'm pretty sure that's supposed to be just pants even though it's like a raised square panel and looks really weird as a result i guess some of the some of the armor plating does something similar though so I should be careful about that. He has a large bottom. I believe the term for this is thick. Built for stealth! <laughs> oh boy. Just last night we were watching the um, Fine Sauce Corruption Stockpile 13 where he makes the dummy thick joke I think three separate times just in the highlights video. <laughs> Admittedly it was pretty fitting each time but the very, the very picture of stealth. Oh no, it's so bad. Felt like fire. Yeah, I mean, he he did mention. He did invoke that meme and other similar, uh, similar phrases many times. His, his booty is extremely developed, yes. It's just... It's, it's just hundreds of pounds of muscle, this guy. He's just so big. 
so much paint is going on to this guy. And so much of it is going on to his butt. It's absolutely preposterous. The butt is taking up all the paint. Um, yeah, all the red, anyway. I just, I like this idea of him having a onesie. Too much for me to abandon it, even though it's impractical. For posterior. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good way to explain it, actually, yeah. Nearly got it. Okay, that's one pant leg done. Holy crap. There is so much pant on him. No, it wasn't a whole pant leg. It was almost a whole pant leg. But I missed a bit of the crotch. Okay. <laughs> More red paint. Okay. Good. Seam between two metal plates here on his knee. And we got something similar on the other side. I'm pretty sure this is just like a lump in his shirt, not a metal plate. It just sort of smoothly goes into either side without changing the texture any. I'm just going to paint over that in red. That armpit all painted up. And polish off the other side of that. Other armpit over here. We got most of earlier, but didn't quite finish. A nice little metal plate under his uh, flank. Or what I hope is that, otherwise it's gills. And I don't want to think about him having gills. So that would be weird. That would be weirder than the sculpt already is. Why does this game have an expansion called Planet of Dr. Moreau? They just wanted to add furries. And, like, I read Freefall, I'm fine with that, but it's still, like, the actual critters are super weird.
I'm okay with gratuitous furries in space. <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess say that again once you've seen this guy's butt in person. <laughs> I mean, you were the one that managed to find Vor in a coloring book within like 10 seconds of opening it. So... <laughs> oh man, I believe the exact phrase he used was I opened this coloring book to a random page, found Vor, I'm out. It was that stupid picture of like a shark with somebody in the side of his stomach talking. This was uh I guess it would have been last year at Mel's birthday party. Yeah, one of those. Yeah. And memory unrepressed. <laughs> sort of feel bad about reminding you. <laughs> all right well if we're cool then all's well Okay. Almost got this freaking undershirt done. Good gracious. I am overpainting a whole bunch because I don't want to deal with like getting a detail brush to go between these areas. And most of that's going to be painted over in a minute anyway. All right, I miss any major areas. Did I miss any minor areas? Just the one. Actually, it looks like I didn't miss it, but I painted it over brown. So it faded out a little bit. Okay, so this is probably about as base coated as we can get in before we get uh, the first coat of wash on. So let's uh, 
get us a bit zoomed in. Or focused in, I should say. So he's going to get a co uh, coat of the umber wash, head to toe. And then once that's done, uh, we'll be dry brushing all over him in a couple colors, uh, and then we'll do the metallic bits. Big toes, yes. Large, large, large toe-large. Uh, let's see, umber wash. I'm going to give it six drops, which is a lot for a single piece. And then once that's done, uh, once, we've, once we've got that done and dried, uh, then we will also go over his skin with a pale gray wash as well. But we're going to apply a bit less of that. Mm, and we'll need a larger brush for this as well because he's big. He has a very large. So that's a pretty similar color to the to what he's already got, actually. That's good. That's uh, that's correctly selected. I would say. We probably really only need to do the red and white portions with this wash. The rest we can probably get by with um, just the pale gray skin. Yeah, no, I... Uh... I noticed that on the Kickstarter page when I was looking for the image that you're seeing. Um, yeah, holy crap. I saw how big that thing is, and I don't even... Like, what even? <laughs> like the size of four of this guy. Yep, all good. Feel free to listen in, but you don't have to. So yeah, we're mostly going to focus on just the uh, the red portions, and then we're going to also hit his feet. Um, I don't think we need to do too much with his arms and legs and head, just because it's already a very similar color. I don't think that's going to add much. Okay. Just hit the toe 